Okay. Okay. Okie dokie. Well, good evening. Welcome to the Amherst Board of Health meeting on March 9th, 2023. And pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, this meeting of the Board of Health will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so by following the instructions on the Board of Health's posted agenda via Zoom or by the posted telephone number available on our website. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access proceedings in real time via technological means. We will post on the Board of Health website a recording of the proceedings as soon as technologically possible after the meeting. All approved minutes of the Board of Health meetings are also posted on our website. I will now open uh, the meeting with the roll call. So Maureen, Here. Lauren Mills, Lauren? She's muted. Um, can you unmute Lauren? Yes, I'm here. Oh, okay, great. Premilinaire? Here. And Nancy Gilbert, here. Um, so far, we don't have Tim. Also in attendance is Ed Smith and Jennifer Brown of the Health Department and Inspections. So the first thing on our agenda is review the minutes from first we'll do January 12th because uh, Lauren lost contact last meeting and we could not um, approve the minutes. And then we'll do the February minutes. So first are the January 12th minutes. Does anyone have any comments? I looked at this a while ago, but I don't recall any concerns. Yes. Okay. I don't have any. Premila? Okay. May I have a motion to accept the January 12th minutes? I'll move to accept the January 12th minutes. And a second? I'll, I'll second it. So uh, a vote, Maureen? Yes. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Lauren? Yes. Premila? Yes. Okay, and Tim is absent, but he also missed the um, January meeting minutes. The next are our February 9th minutes. And I looked at them and did not see anything. Does anyone have any comments? They have any changes, comments or additions on the February 9th minutes? No. Can we have a motion to accept the February 9th minutes? Motion to accept. Okay, a second. second. I'll second. Then first, I've been uh, seconded and now for accepting them. Premila? Okay. Maureen? Aye. Lauren? <laughs> Yes. And Nancy Gilbert, aye. So they have been accepted. Next on the agenda are a public comment. Um, I don't see any attendees, so I don't think we'll have any public comment. And first item um, is old business. And I have the community assessment. And the students are working hard. They've been doing key informant slash stakeholder interviews. They're having trouble setting up listening sessions. I know they've worked with Lauren. They have a date um, and that you just need to confirm a time on that one. Um, they had one listening session at the senior center. 
they will be having another listening session with Cress, and then they're trying to set up a few more listening sessions. Um, they're also planning to organize their data for the report using Healthy People 2030, Social Determinants of Health, and there's a, a wheel um, looking at economic stability, education access and quality, healthcare access and quality, neighborhood and built environments, and social and community context. That's how the social determinants are organized now under Healthy People 2030. Um, so I will keep you abreast. Does anyone have any questions? Okay. Next on the agenda is Body Arts Establishment. Um, I, know I went over some uh, regulations and Maureen has spent a lot of time going over uh, other Board of Health regulations for more updated ones. Do you have anything to say, Maureen? Well, I'll just say, I guess, I sent out something that was based on your list of, of right. things that came to your attention, but also things that I kind of looked into as I was thinking about this. Um, clearly, just plopping in a, a section on a guest artist it is may not be what we want to do. We could do that. I sent a couple of, they're very short, uh, regulations that explain how a guest artist might be qualified to come and spend two weeks with another in an, in a, in an Amherst establishment uh, twice a year for a small license fee. Um, but we really haven't looked at these since 2008. I'm on my iPad, so I don't have everything in front of me. Mm -hmm. um, but there were some uh, significant small items that I think would be important, like requiring a photo ID for um, clients and um, practitioners and for documentation for the, the parents and the child, if it's a person under 18. Um, you know, some of those, those are simple and probably pretty important to make sure we're, we have who the information about the person who's doing this and the person who's having it done. There are ways to open this up in a much bigger way in, in Northampton and um, some other communities. They actually have a program of apprenticeship that, and those are defined and what, what's required of an apprentice and what's required of a trainer. And, um, you know, it's, it's a lot of regulation. I mean, it, we, we could, Cop, you know, we could base it off of some of those existing regulations, but is that something we want to go toward? Um, there are also other health regulations in different places, like uh, in Provincetown, where I expect they have a lot of body artists. Um, they require um, TB testing for the practitioners. Um, they're not, they're the same on the and hepatitis screening is, as as everyone else, um, but but there are some other additional health screenings um, in Northampton. They're requiring a policy and procedure manual in addition to having a copy of the regulations on hand. Um, there are some increased as uh, requirements of um, on the use of the autoclave and it uh, assuring that it's working properly. Um, it's, so it's, it's, it's kind of a lot. And there's, a, there's another section where Amherst says, here's what you can do. Like you can pierce an eyebrow or a nose or an ear or a navel or a nipple. A, a lot of other places say what you can't do. And a lot of that is involves genital piercing, and, but also like neck and back and chest and my sense is it's easier to say what you can do than think of all the things you can't do, you know, um, just because people are pretty inventive and <laughs> they might want to do things that we might want to have them do. So I, 
I guess I wanted to bring this up and think about what people, how people feel about where we want to go with this. Any, I thought, any thoughts? I also have a concern about our regulations and how are we enforcing them? Can we enforce everything? Do we need to, who, Ed, do you go and inspect tattoo parlors? I have currently Susan Malone is doing them this year. Susan does. Does we she just, go every year to check? Between the two of us, we have, I believe it's possible we missed one of the pandemic years. Oh, okay. um, but um, yeah. Oh, an annual have, inspection. Mm -hmm. Yeah, an annual inspection and to make sure that the um, establishment and the practitioners renew their licenses. Um, currently, we have one establishment with one practitioner in it, the owner of the shop. Um, he had two or three other people. Um, and I think during the pandemic, business fell off quite a bit. I think somebody left the area. Um, people moved to other shops. East Hampton especially seems to be on the rise for a location for shops. Mm -hmm. um, and Northampton's always been quite strong for shops. Mm -hmm. As we add, to the regulations, how does that affect you and Susan as inspectors? I think that the things that you're talking about um, would be more clear clarifications of, I, I, I don't think that there would be too much dispute. Um, trying to remember, Stephen, the owner of the current shop in Amherst is quite interested in um, if there's an opportunity for him to help or be involved, I'm sure he would be interested. Mm -hmm. he's, he's experienced, he's worked in several towns and he's been, um, he has a consistently good record of maintaining the shop and keeping the people that are working in the shop in line. There's, there's one thing about the shops that I'll just throw out is that they operate a little bit like some of the delivery companies um, in that they call themselves I think independent contractors uh, working within the shop. Um, yeah. And that's more for, I think, their purposes, maybe tax wise. Um, mm -hmm. But um, it's just an oddity. Um, we would still make sure that they all have their proper licenses, that the facility is licensed. Mm -hmm. That's, that hasn't been a problem. <clears throat> that's common practice, actually. And other mm -hmm. It seems surprising to me that this isn't something that is licensed by the state. The the practitioners, I mean, aren't hairdressers and barbers licensed by the state? <laughs> it seems more invasive than any of those things. Yeah, I'm not but, sure the history behind that. Um, tattoo powers have been around for a long time, but the, the state I think it's reluctant to take on any more inspections if they mm -hmm. can avoid it. Yeah. The state only started variation from town to town. It's and the training and things, it's not well or as well organized as maybe like other states like Connecticut or whatever, where they have a, a different way of looking at it. Mm -hmm. Massachusetts is newer to allowing tattoo parlors because I know my son around 2000 got a tattoo and he had to go to Connecticut so it's only about 2002 that Massachusetts allowed tattoo parlors I, I, I would have to check the the exact date so it's um, a newer entity in Massachusetts mm -hmm. and in Connecticut Uh, I was just wondering, um, from what you said, Maureen, um, is it, uh, what is the reasons for the client having the picture ID and isn't it better to also say what you cannot do? Because if you don't state what you cannot pierce, then can the uh, um, tattoo artist just pierce it? 
it anyway, or is it like, I guess from just my thinking, as you said, the state regulations, I don't know what they, they regulate, but if it's not, um, the if the town regulations don't state what cannot be pierced, does that allow them to pierce whatever they want to pierce or? No, it actually says you could only pierce these things and nothing else, basically. So I think, I think people take, I think you could argue it either way, but, um, but it seems clear to me that you can't, it, from our regulations, that you can't do any sort of genital piercing. And that's a lot of those things that are prescribed in other, um, other towns, but, you know, so, I guess I, I look at it as we it's it seems like you could come up with something that's not written down and that wouldn't be a good idea that you wouldn't think of writing and saying no you can't do that um, but rather than say you can pierce these different body parts and I do not believe that our existing tattoo parlor, they do not do piercings at this time. Right, right. I, but I guess we need, if we're going to do this. Yeah, we do, we do, we do, do we do. Correctly, because another parlor might do piercings. Yeah, or they might add up an, another um, con independent contractor who wants to do the, take on the piercings. Yeah, and they have in the um, past. Yeah. So, um, what is the sense of the need for the the apprentice an apprentice program? I know, I know the establishment isn't asking for that particularly. Is that another thing we want to have in preparation for a new or a different establishment or this? person deciding to do a little bit more. Um, I mean, it doesn't hurt anything, but it, it's a lot of, <laughs> I guess it's a lot of, a lot of regulation to kind of just look at and uh, review and try to fine tune. Um, we actually, and I, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Ed. I was going to say, we actually did work out an apprenticeship arrangement with Stephen Lambert, his last name is, um, who is the owner of the shop. He did have somebody working there maybe for a year, three or two years ago, who um, Stephen took all responsibility, was there all the time that this um, person was there. We mm -hmm. um, gave them sort of a provisional license um, mm -hmm. And it worked out well, except for Stephen and mm -hmm. that the fellow left to go to another shop when he'd finished. Uh, <laughs> but it, but it, it was. I mean, we thought that Stephen had the makings of a good teacher; that it was a good environment. Yeah. And yeah, we. Yeah. No. So maybe license. we should maybe put that in there. I mean, it might encourage more businesses to be in town and that's one of the things we want to do i mean um so i don't have any problems just maybe putting my wrap my head around it and try to get a a, a rough draft of of all of that kind of regulation kind of pulling from different places that we can all take a look at, at at some time, perhaps as soon as the next meeting. I don't know how anxious they are to get the visiting artists in there, but this, this as you know, regular, our regulations do take all the time with the turnaround from, from meeting to meeting. Mm -hmm. uh, any other thoughts? You know, use as much from Northampton. Don't reinvent that wheel. <laughs> no, I know. Well, yeah. well, there's a there's a kind of funky actually. There's some like typos and things that yeah. don't connect. And 
uh, you know, I know that happens. Um, I, I don't East have my are... file of other ones. I know I looked at Melrose. I can't remember. I looked at about eight different towns that had East, newer... East Hampton is based off of Northampton, but it seems a little cleaner and okay. um, <laughs> maybe a little less complex. Uh, you know, I don't know that a policy and procedure manual adds more to the regulations themselves, which are quite detailed. Yeah, but, they are uh, with, with, you know, autoclaving like and all of that. All of that. Yeah. So. Um, and I do like the idea of having hepatitis, the, the practitioners having hepatitis uh, immunization. I think for safety. Well, nobody required, nobody's required that. It's all been, you have to have the educated. It's like the the OSHA training and well, the North risks. I thought Northampton what? had, hep. I thought Northampton had hep B and Worcester had, you needed to have your hepatitis immunizations. I don't think I saw it, that it was required, but I'll double check. I mean, it might have been Worcester. I, I don't have that pile of stuff here with me. Yeah, I, I think it's hard to require that kind of, I don't know. But I, I don't think Northampton did. I think there was a, it said it's strongly recommended. And oh. then there was like, that was item A and then item B, if you do have the hepatitis B. So I felt like when I read it, it, it told me one thing and it sort of okay. jumped to another. Thing. Might have been yeah. Yeah. Or yeah. Will, Williamstown has, I think, a requirement for hep, hep B. That's the only one I saw, thought I saw. So it's hot, it's not, I mean, it makes sense. Um, so we can, that's something I guess to look at a little more closely and maybe to try to decide about that. Um, you know, depending on how old the per people are, it doesn't really work that well, the vaccine in older people. But anyway, it's, it's, that's neither here nor there. Um, so I, I will take another stab at, at some of this and come, try to come up with something that we could look at and compare our regulation. I don't know if anybody no, I don't think I sent out the whole thing. I, I put, put together something where I went through our regulation and added whatever was in Northampton that was more than what we had in in um, side, like in a separate color in the same paragraphs. So to try to follow their, to, to, to try to combine the two. I could send that draft out, but it's kind of a messy thing. Um, I, I, I tried looking at it and one of them what uh, stuff came out black and I couldn't read everything and I, so I just uh, yeah I, it's hard to copy it's hard to get a editable copy but I, yeah. I I was able to do that so I will see what I can do and um and I'll send some of it along to Premal for when she has time to take a look at that perhaps and we'll see where we are okay Okay, thank you. So now we're gonna move on to new business. And first thing in new business is our um, housing code amendments and overview. And we have Ed for that. Oh, thank you. This is um, something that when I took the state housing training 12 years ago, it was just around the corner and we've just turned the corner and it's arrived, or it will arrive. Uh, the estimates get early in April. So maybe April 1st, but sometime in April for sure. And there are, I think a lot of the changes are uh, more bringing the code language sort of um, to date, but it also um, catches up with some things that have developed in the last 50, 50 so years that the code's been around. So I'm gonna share my screen and try to, um, I'm, not, I'm not gonna jump around too much. Um, I'll, I'm gonna end up on my notes and stay there. But um, let me see if I can first pull up the original code, <clears throat> which this is, um, this is the code that 
John Thompson and Susan Malone and I use um, weekly, if not daily, on housing inspections in town. And with um, the reason actually that there are so many of us doing housing is because Amherst's you know, nature as a college town with not enough on-campus housing is that there's a lot in town and there are a lot of these relationships between tenant and landlord that come and go. Um, I don't know what the average tenancy in town is, but it's probably between one and two years. And if you go maybe to Northampton or some other town with their own peculiar to their economy circumstances, I imagine they're most renters are there for a longer period of time than that. So there's a lot of churning and flux in our housing market. And so we often are mediating housing disputes or concerns, complaints, a lack of uh, maintenance perhaps, or um, we do certainly apply the code to tenants when that's appropriate, when the landlords are looking for help, you know, with uh, someone who's not cleaning, who's being destructive to their unit. But this is the uh, the sort of old fashioned sounding minimum standards of fitness for human habitation. Um, the sanitary code, the housing code, it's often called 105 CMR 410. And this, I think, came out in the early 70s. And it, it does a pretty good job uh, of defining and laying out um, issues that you know, can arise um, and it's meant to be minimum standards. So everything above this is fine. It's, you know, it's extra. It might not be aesthetics. It might feel pretty necessary, but this is the baseline that we approve to. Um, so the, let's see if I can go to the other, um, the new code, which unfortunately, you know, the numbers changed quite a bit. So that will make it a little hard for us to, to, um, to get with that, but that's all right, we'll learn. Um, it's a little more organized in a way, I think that will help us find issues when we're trying to cite somebody. We're mm -hmm. trying to figure, figure out why a leaking faucet is a problem. You know, we can go to the plumbing section, session, section whether it's in the kitchen or in the bathroom section. Um, but I made some notes and I think that's what I should go to and share those. Let's see. One, my apologies, one second. I know I'm lost. Okay, can you see the 2023 sanitary code update? Is that sharing? No, not okay. yet. No, no. Let's see. Let me know if there's anything I can do on my end. Ed. Okay. Um, there we go. This is it. Yeah. Okay. Um, so a few things they told us. Uh, it's John, Susan, and <clears throat> I have all attended trainings now from the state uh, board of uh, community sanitation. Question I'd always had was how far does the code go back? And originally to 1960, and it was funded in 1972. Um, it was followed after that by adoption statewide of um, a standardized building code. Um, and because it's not listed as a subsidiary code, it's always been, I think, felt as uh, separate and you know complementary, but um, it stands on its own. And I'll, I just highlighted some notes that have occurred to me as I'm reading it. I'm sure as we put it into practice, we'll see more um, useful differences. And there are some challenges. One thing that we've always had a hard time with um, is the, the, the original code was written very much um, with violations of the owner in mind. There is a limited number of responsibilities of the tenant that are important. But the predominant uh, number is with the owner. But affected persons is now a phrase that we could use and is used in, in some of the language because- Ed, it's a little hard to hear you. I think. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, that's, that's even better, okay. yeah. It's my hand. Um, 
Anyway, some of the violations can occur equally, whether it's the tenant or the owner. Um, so another place, pests used to not have a separate citation for arachnids for spiders. Um, and we occasionally get this academic argument that birds can't be in the infestation. Arachnids are not insects, are rodents aren't other categorized pest um, types from the old code. The old code didn't deal with recycling at all. Um, and now most communities, all communities have um, quite a few regulations about recyclables and it makes it easier for us to cite um, issues that are, you know, something to do with not, not garbage, not useful possessions, but this other category of thing that falls into recyclables. Um, a residence now includes all the structures on a property, which in the past that wasn't really clear. You could have a rental house with a falling down garage or a falling down outbuilding, which might present a hazard. You had to make a more complicated argument that this represented a, an issue on a property. But now by including all structures, it's going to be easier to site for maintenance of buildings. Um, I don't think it necessarily means that every little structure has to be in perfect shape, but if it's not going to be maintained fit to use, it needs to be secured so that it doesn't present a hazard. Um, the old code didn't really deal with temporary shelters at all, and that's something that does come up now, and um, that will help with uh, shelters that are maintained in Amherst, for example. Ed, can you speak up a little bit, please? I'm yes, sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thanks. Let's see. Um, kitchen facilities, if there was not a definition in the past for what constituted the appliances, it was mentioned that you, know, you had to have a range, but now a size of the range is there. And for the first time, it includes a refrigerator and freezer unless it's excluded from a lease. In the past, a landlord just had to provide a space for a refrigerator um, and an outlet convenient for that space. Um, these can still be excluded in the lease if it's spelled out and the tenant agrees to it. So there's some flexibility. Um, I'm sure that some of the complexes that um, you know, don't offer something will put that in lease language now instead of just assuming that the code's not checking to see whether they're providing the refrigerator. Um, the next section, hot water, there actually were some discrepancies with the plumbing code, and those have been cleaned up. Um, you don't want as hot water in a bathtub or shower for scalding reasons. Um, and that's the way plumbing fixtures are meant to keep um, the temperature to 120 or below, but also above 110, so it's efficacious for, for cleaning. For the first time, eating systems don't, we, we now know what to say about wood and pellet stoves and space heaters uh, and fireplaces. They aren't prohibited, they just can't be depended on. There's not, you, you can't, the tenant can choose to use a wood stove, say, to heat, but they have to be provided with a permanent installed system um, not as backup, but as the primary, the backup is the wood stove. So that cleaned up something. Um, the next one is important to the Board of Health. You've entertained requests for variances in the past from the Clark House uh, mm -hmm. for the beginning of the heating system. And now the language has moved up the date from June 1st. Now you can, or maybe it was June 15th. Sorry, and um, is now June first, but you can alter it to May fifteenth as easily as, say, in the May meeting, looking at the upcoming weather, deciding that this is going to be a warm May, and people are going to be wanting to switch from heat to air conditioning sooner, and you can post that on the website, and it's done. 
you don't have to entertain you know, a hearing uh, from anybody who's petitioning you for that. Um, so that, I think, that takes something potentially off your calendar. Let's see. Down to owner's installation, maintenance, and repair responsibilities. One issue that we've had in the past is a landlord or electrician leaving a mess after they make a repair. And finally, they have to clean up after themselves. In you know, the wording is there. Okay, that the job is done when it's clean, um, and also when things have dried. Um, in the next one, there's this is a complimentary occupants uh, citation here. Some things the owner installs that are necessary. Um, some things the occupant may bring in that are optional and what are highlighted there, the air conditioners and the microwave ovens are common uh, things for us to have issues around air conditioners that are not secured in windows. Last week, I did a VAT inspection of that complaint about how are the VATs getting into a townhouse apartment unit. And I found an issue with the owner supplied air conditioner. The grill was loose on the outside, leaving a gap. But the tenants had also brought in their own air conditioner for another bedroom. They had installed it and put in the foam stripping that seals between the sashes. And that actually is important to save energy, but also to exclude pests. So, um, you know, the conclusion was we don't know which one it was, but they both have to get fixed. So that's kind of a, you know, real life you know, issue that we're trying to use the codes to mediate. Um, it's now explicit in the means of egress that all residences have to have two means of egress. Uh, it used to be more like as many as are sufficient and sufficient is two or more, which helps closets need light fixtures if the light in the room is not bright enough. Um, that's new. Um, that may or may not have much effect, but The next one, the interesting thing there is when we write orders to correct, and we give a copy of our inspection sheet to the tenant, to the landlord, we're supposed to include for the tenant's benefit the notice of occupant's rights. And, and that includes things like um, if a landlord has not corrected an issue um, that a health inspector has cited, um, if it goes beyond the repair time allowed, the tenant can withhold rent, for example. The tenant can also use their own money to make the repair and then withhold that from the rent, you know, the costs of the repair. So those rights are enumerated on a sheet. And now the landlords have to have a sheet, which is, um, that's a positive thing. Um, I mentioned earlier that homeless shelters are in the code now for the first time. They'll come up again in a minute with some pest requirements. Um, the next one, number 500, this is one of the few ones where the numbers stayed the same between the new and the old code. The owner's responsibility to maintain building and structural elements. This is probably the co most commonly used section of the code for us, but it now includes a section where, and this has been taken for best practices, to keep mold from arising in a housing situation. Um, the owner shall ensure surfaces have been dried within 48 hours. So when you have a flood, when you have a massive leak in a house, you engage a company like Service Master or somebody to come in with big air conditioners and fans and you know, try to dry it out. Their goal is to try to get it done within 48 hours to get back to a normal level of moisture in sheetrock, say that stays your floor. Um, and it's not easily done, it can be done, and it needs to be done if you don't want to have to rip out a lot of moldy building materials. Um, the next one, elimination of tests. When you rent a single family house, the code has always said the tenant is responsible for treating for pests. And that's still there, but 
there's an exception. If the owner hasn't been, you know, keeping up with the entry point, say, um, in the basement and house itself, you know, the holes that the pests have made in the past, if those haven't been fixed, it's not on the tenant to try to treat around those. But that those violations just throw the responsibility back on the landlord. Um, first, you fix, you know, the, the source of the problem, and then you treat the, the symptom or the um, the past itself. And also new, and this is where I mentioned in temporary shelters, um, there's language explicit about temporary shelters with this letter F. When you turn over an apartment, you now have to inspect for pests. In the past, that hasn't been explicit. Um, homeless shelters do have an exception from that because they will have a pest management policy and periodic inspections in place. That'll be part of what allows them to operate. But in an individual um, unit, when I, as a landlord, turn over a unit, I have to go through and make an inspection and I have to document. I need to keep um, essentially evidence that um, I am looking for pests. If I find entry points, I'm eliminating them, I'm documenting them, and that they're available to you, to the board, upon request. And I can ask for those as your agent, so as I'm doing inspections. So that actually, I think, will help a lot. Another one that will help us in Amherst quite a bit um, is uh, trash put out for collection and trash cans left perpetually by the curb, which is one of our common problems. Um, the code was kind of unrealistic in that. It said you could only put it out in the day of collection in the past. And now you can put it out the day before if it's in a pest-proof container. So not just a bag on the sidewalk the night before, a bag in a trash can with the lid closed on the sidewalk or next to the sidewalk. I'm sorry, you can't block the the, um, the, the right of way or the um, the travel lane, whether it's the road or whether it's the sidewalk. Um, we're almost done. I'm promising. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see, five seventy. An interesting point here is that standing water. Can be cited more easily now in the past as a uh, issue um, on a parcel of land. So, if someone's gutters say are creating a you know draining and not being sent off to a permeable area of the, of the yard, it's just you know ponding and potentially causing problems. We can judge that to be so and make an order. Six twenty. Is mentioned something that's helpful about mold. Um, we often get asked, do we do mold testing? And we don't. We can use signs of mold or the appearance of mold as evidence that there is excessive, excessive moisture present. Um, but we don't have to pay for environmental testing. Um, environmental testing is still not you know, recognized in the state as being. A guideline, you know, like a certain level of a specific type of mold found is not citable. Um, but we can use mold as an evidence that the moisture level in the house is too high and look for the source, the plumbing, the roof leak, the, you know, whatever it is, the um, water in the basement that's causing problems in the first floor. Then this, the last section here, these are the things that could most likely bring a hearing to the Board of Health, and I thought I would just go over them. They really haven't changed. They used to be in the section that was number 750. Now it's 630, but it's the same title, Conditions Deemed to Endanger or Material or Impair Health or Safety. We used to have, under the code, three levels of citation. Something either need to get fixed within 24 hours, within five days, or within 30 days. 30 days, for example, would be something like if you know someone needed to make a plaster repair, say that's not um, an immediate danger. Um, 
but it's a deficiency by the code. And so we could fix the plaster, do a second coat, paint it, and you know that easily fits into 30 days. Um, but other things, and these are enumerated here, are much more immediate. There was a subcategory of these that, like the kitchen sink, if your kitchen sink was too small, you had five days to, to fix it. Now, um, you should know better, I think, is the, the message in the code. And that's judged to be the same level of issue um, for the landlord to repair as these other things. But I'll just read these very quickly. Um, supply of water, sufficient quantity, pressure, and temperature. Failure to provide heat. Um, failure to restore or shut off electricity, gas, or water. Um, standard electrical facilities not being provided. Um, just a quick example of that. We inspected an apartment about seven or eight years ago, and the wiring was patently unsafe. Um, it was um, aluminum wiring in the house, which is, it's the only time I've ever seen it in Amherst. And we called in the electrical inspector and condemned the house and it was you know, repaired. you know, as almost on an emergency basis. Um, safe supply of water is essential. These are things, again, that can condemn a house um, or, you know, lead to condemnation if the landlord doesn't fix. Um, the lack of a toilet, sink, shower, bathtub, or sewage disposal system. Um, then the following things, these are the old, they used to be five days, now they're 24 hours. The sink, the cooktop oven, the refrigerator and freezer, that's new to the code, but that's important that it's there. Um, adequate exits, egress is very important in the code. Um, security requirements, these are the locks in your windows and doors that keep you safe. Um, there's a catch-all section here about any source of causes of sickness, including coverage for rodents. Lead-based paint. Um, in in terms of it being accessible to um, somebody under the age of six, um, there's another broad section here, number twelve: roof foundation and defects that can expose the occupant to substantial danger. Um, number thirteen is all about using proper technicians to do specific work. So not using unlicensed handy people instead of you know certified installers. Um, asbestos is still there, still a problem. Um, smoke detectors and carbon monoxide alarm, one of the most important things we do. Um, I think this is more explicit now, uh, railings and guards for stairways, porches, balconies. Um, this actually is important in Amherst with a lot of student parties in vulnerable places. Um, you know, the roof's off deck, but insufficiently built, um, you know, walkway leading up to a second floor unit, um, pests. And then in the end, you know, the last two really just allow us to make a case that something not listed above can be substantially dangerous and could be used to take a 24 hour correction um, citation. And I didn't go into 710. There's a lot of, the, this is brand new to us, um, permit requirements for alternative housing. This gives the Board of Health some leeway. If somebody say is proposing a tiny house or you know, alternative housing, they used a houseboat as an example when we were doing the training, that there's more leeway for you to consider you know, whether it's necessary to hold alternative forms of housing to the same standards as um, traditional housing. Um, and I think that is something we'll learn more about as we begin to work with um, those things in town, not houseboats per se, but all tiny houses. <laughs> so there's a lot of talking on my part and I'd be happy to share. The new code hasn't really been published. It's not on mass.gov, for example, yet. Um, I don't know, Jen, did that go out? The, some of those attachments that I sent. Um, I sent out, and you know, I'm just thinking I forgot to post this to the 
the web page, I apologize. I did send the climatological data to the, the Board of Health mm -hmm. members. Um, I thought that was interesting. So they did receive some of your documents. Ed, oh, okay, you. good. So we're looking at adopt, you know, putting this into effect in maybe three weeks. Do the managers and, and owners have this information or how are they going to know? I've, um, we haven't sent out a specific mailing yet. We've been talking about it with individual landlords as we work with them, um, probably for the last three or four months. Um, and I've shared it with a few, but I think that I'm kind of reluctant to send it out until the state publishes it. Um, it might be good for us to send out a heads up, you know, this is coming. And it's also starting to appear in news sources. Um, I know Greenfield's Board of um, Health Department did put out um, a, or made a, they were the subject of a small news story and a couple of state like Lambert's organizations have had a couple articles online too. So yeah. it's spreading. But the literal final code hasn't been promulgated yet. So um, I think probably we could alert people that we will release that as soon as possible. Thank you so much, Ed. I really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. it sounds like it's really going to promote some healthy living, living conditions. Yeah. I'm sorry, I strayed outside my 10 minutes. But... <laughs> Thank you, Ed. <laughs> Does oh. anyone have any questions for Ed? You know, I have a question. <laughs> okay, Lauren. Um, is, one is kind of random. Um, I want to know, you said this is um, mainly for tenants and, and landlords. Um, how, what is the percentage of homes that are are tenant filled? Do you do you know like the percentage of people who are homeowners and they live in their homes versus those houses that are rented out? And um, just also the second question is the recycling. I I still don't I still in my mind don't understand like the the plans for the zero waste and all those other initiatives how it all correlates together. So I don't know if you can expound on that because I know that for me, where I live, I do not see any recycling initiatives taking place. So I'm just wondering how these new regulations will incorporate, like you said, how will the landlords know about these initiatives and these new regulations and specifically the recycling, how, does, how, how will that be? put into into place for for renters let's see so I, your first question the percentage of homes in amherst that are rented out is an interesting one and i i would really be guessing but i will try to i'll see if i can get so ed, a handle on that yes and we have that in our uh community assessment data I don't have it with me here. Lauren, I believe we sent that out when it was presented and you can look in it and it has by census tract, um, uh, renter versus owner occupied and East Amherst and South Amherst have less renter occupied than Central Amherst and North Amherst, but I don't have that data with me to tell you, but it's in that report, Lauren. And if you want, um, I can get it to you next week. Does that answer your question, Lauren? Yes. Um, yeah. And what about the recycling? So Amherst landlords through the residential rental registration program are required to, um, to to certify, to pledge, to sign off each year when they renew, that they follow all applicable state and local regulations. So they are required to follow like the Board of Health's recycling regulations in town. Um, 
we at present don't have a recycling coordinator or someone who's specifically doing that job. We had a grant funded job a couple of years ago and that person was able to dedicate their time to going around and problem solving, you know, with mostly with complexes or larger landlords, but also with some smaller, you know, um, one-off rentals. Um, if there was, if they could help them with their recycling programs. Um, there are a lot of re recycling regulations that we don't actively enforce. Um, they're in place, and I think most places you know, try to comply with them. But you know, we are not regularly going out and making sure that dumpsters, you know, roll-off containers or whatever, have the percentage, um, the, you know, below the, the allowed percentage, say, of recycling in them. It's not something that we, you know, frankly, have been asked to do, but it, it's important, but it's hard to, under, to figure out where we would find the time to do that on an effective basis. If somebody was flagrantly violating, we do on an individual basis bring that up when, say, a, a rental house starts using their recycling toter and their garbage toter just all for garbage, that we'll cite the landlord for that. That they're not doing it. Um, they're they're responsible for their tenants doing the right thing, if you will. Um, but I'm I have never gone out and you know refused a garbage truck, you know, to continue loading. Um, and we've had some manpower problems in some of the companies this year where trucks wouldn't come, trucks were breaking down, they didn't have the repair people, they didn't have the drivers, and recycling bins at big complexes had to be used for trash just to safely contain stuff. We had problems at Hampshire College for bears um, when they weren't doing that. Uh, so uh, those seem to smooth out. The companies are doing much, much better. Uh, so it's a challenging topic, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. Yes, uh, uh, let me follow up a little bit. I, I'm more thinking of like when you separate your like for instance if you have plastic bottles if you separate your plastic bottles but then when you take it out you might mix up the plastic bottles with the regular trash or just throw the trash in the recycling like it seems like there's no clear like um incentive to like uh keep the recyclables separate. And so I'm more asking about that. Like, is there, maybe I'm kind of off of the regulations and more of a like incentive program, but I'm just, I, I just, you know, I just see that there's not, there could be more recycling if there was a clear way of recycling. And so that's mainly why I was asking. Yeah. I think DPW maybe could tell us more about um, how successful recycling is is working in town from their experience at the transfer station. Um, I know that the it's very hard to sell recycling if the company buying it is not uh, judging it to be of a good quality. You know, if it's contaminated with garbage. Um, with materials that shouldn't be in the recycling, then they just won't take it and it has to be, you know, disposed of um, at cost. And I know that the prices have gone down on some of the recycling. So the incentives, the financial incentives are there, um, which would help a lot. Any other questions for Ed? Thank you, Ed. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks for inviting me. Okay, that's a that's a lot to digest. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Thank okay. you. Ed. All right. Yeah. Thanks. I'm gonna take. Thank off. you. All right. See you soon. Okay. Yep. Bye. Okay. Long time coming, and now it's gonna be here. 
Um, the geothermal well um, driller for Rolling Ridge. And Jen, you got an update that the well driller license certificate was updated. Yes, um, and it was submitted and I believe I distributed it to people in their packets mm -hmm. to see, yeah. That was a good pickup, Premla. <laughs> Okay, and I last week I went to the UMass Public Health and Health Science Career Fair. I had um, thought of going and asked Jen last year to go. I went. Um, I, I told Jen I don't think it's the best use of time um, for our department or for the board now that I've been there. Um, but I did make a contact with Megan, pa uh, Megan Patton, who is, I believe the, the, the Dean or the director of undergrad programs right now. And I'm going to meet with her in two weeks, right after spring break, um, to just talk about the school of public health and the board of health. And she's new, fairly new to UMass. I think she's been there this is her second year and so I'm just going to meet with her to talk about the board of health and the health department um and I'll let you know what what uh what goes from there um but that was uh it was interesting but it was not a good use of time for our department so Jen that's that um, that's it under new business. Director's update. Nancy, thank you for going to that. And did you like our new employees' material? Did yes, I have yeah, to good. return to you, but then I was leaving and oh, that's beginning the day I was going to bring. It. Yes, and um, yes, it was. Okay. It was good. It was. It was interesting. It was great seeing students. Um, yeah. yeah. But I was giving them, answering more questions for them about different things in the area than, um, so I felt like I was a faculty member there. <laughs> faculty member. Yep, so I have um, some, uh, I have six, six things I'm gonna review in the director's um, update. This is the first time that I, well, in three years, I haven't put, um, uh, COVID update um, specifically. So I just thought I'd mention that, of course, we're going to continue to monitor it. And but I just wanted to sort of blend it into um, what I talk about in this section. Um, as we are still in the pandemic section, sort of moving out into the endemic um, area of, of this pandemic. We're not there yet, but um, we definitely are getting there, but we still have people in town, vulnerable populations that are getting sick. Um, we've had clusters of people that are being um, that have been ill with COVID, and we've reached out to them. We still have a contact tracer or case management um, personnel, Joseph Afoso, on on staff, and he's been working with um, town residents. So if anyone ever has any questions about um, home antigen tests, rapid tests, if you're positive. Or if you've had an exposure, please feel free to, to speak to us about that. Um, but this is also a reminder that three years ago today, we had our first case um, of uh, COVID. And uh, I don't remember the exact date, but it was around the 15th or so that um, we decided to shut things down and we were, sent, we were sent home. So very dramatic. A lot obviously has gone on in that time, we've had 10,652 known cases of COVID since that time. Um, so again, our surveillance data is down. Um, we just don't have that PCR that we're counting, um, but we continue in the health department as I'm sure you do, um, you know, residents and as board members to go to some really good websites. I still go to the Department of Public Health. Um, their um, interactive uh, module is excellent and they have a good wastewater module as well. And it's always good to see the, um, I think I forget what it's called, the CDC Now data and you can see what, um, uh, what, um, oh my gosh, I'm blanking. Um, 
what the uh, the type of um, of COVID is uh, is trending right now. I'm so sorry. I'm just blanking on that. I'm going too fast. Um, so we still have um, rapid antigen tests. Um, we have uh, lots to go around if anyone wants those. We are distributing them here at the health department, but we also are giving them to our partners like the Amherst um, Survival Center. Um, they're still a great public health tool, so we really want people leveraging those. Um, we still are continuing with our bivalent booster clinics. Um, if it's someone that wants a second um, uh, uh, vaccine in their series or the first vaccine, we can get that. Just let us know. Um, we are having sort of a good turnout. People that maybe have been on the fence are coming in. Um, but just to let you know that if you have your bivalent booster, then you're up to date. There's no other um, new schedule or a regimen on the immediate horizon that I'm aware of. Um, so that's it for COVID. Does anyone have any questions about that? No, thank you. Okay, so um, then just moving into um, our uh, public health nurse, Olivia is doing some really um, exciting uh, work and we're so happy to have her here in the health department. She's starting uh, public health nursing hours. Um, she'll be starting that here in the Bang Center. She's gonna be working, or she started already working with Haley in the Senior Center and she'll be offering those services there. And then also she's been talking to Craig Stores and they've been great partners to work with. She'll be going to the ILC and the University Motor Lodge twice a month and providing nursing services there. So we have the policy and procedure that we're creating and some of the um, things that she'll be offering. And we'll just start out slow and we'll see where it goes with that. Um, but I think just getting in there and starting the you know, relationship with people is really such a valuable tool um, to really see some better health outcomes. The other thing uh, is we have a new interpreter service in town. We've had them before, but this is through ARPA money and we're happy to get this going. So it's through ITI out of um, Hartford. And what we do is we've assigned, we have assigned PIN numbers here in the health department I've also shared it with Cress and the um, and the senior center, and it's on-demand telephone service. And we've used it a few times for some dialects we haven't understood for Spanish. And within seconds, we can get people um, uh, communicating with uh, someone who speaks their language. Um, and it's just a great thing that we have. So we're happy to have that. Um, Olivia was using it um, earlier with someone who speaks Portuguese. So it was really um, a great thing. We're very happy to have that. The remote provision uh, meeting is something that we need to um, discuss. So I'm looking at my notes up here. So it, originally it was supposed to end um, March 31st, 2023. And we have not heard from the state yet what's gonna happen to that. We might hear on the 30th, but we should all be sort of prepared to, to see what happens with that. So the legislature right now in Massachusetts is considering extending the current practice two more years, but we haven't heard anything on that. If there is no new legislation or extension, then the boards will be, and committees will be required to meet um, the rules of the open meeting law um, and be in person. Um, if there is new legislation or extension that we can continue on virtually. So we should be preparing for April um, to meet in person, but um, I'll keep you updated as, it, as we get any more information. Did that make sense? Yes, anyone have any questions on that? No. Okay. And the word I was stumbling on before was variant. I used to use it seven <laughs> times a day, 10 times a day. I'm blocking it out. Um, and then I want to talk about Board of Health members. Um, 
So we have, um, we'll be losing some board members this year. Does anyone have any announcements? Um, who's going to be leaving? I, I'm, my term is up and because of term limits, I can't extend my time. Okay. Any other announcements? I believe I'm, I'm, um, my term is expiring in June. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. So thank you, Lauren. I know I sent you an email and both of you for your time and hard work here, but we'll talk more about that and what you've added all all of you, both of you. Um, so, you know, as we start thinking about um, recruiting new people, um, just think about, um, you know, Nancy and the board members, I would ask you, what skill set are we looking for when we put the word out? You know, I think when I think of things, it might be different from you, but I think about um, the you know, drinking water. I know, Lauren, that's something that's dear to your heart, but the civil and maybe environmental engineering, but that's something for you. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> maybe if you can contribute to that conversation. Yeah, it's, uh, it's always very important to have a civil um, or environmental and or uh, engineer on the, the board. For a while, we had two. Um, it's we need a doctor and it's uh, and it's very helpful um, um, that we have a nurse. So right now you have two nurses with one coming off. So so those areas are and um, people with some public health background because yeah, it, I see. Um, it, 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 there's a learning curve and it's um, much different than I remember when I first went on the Board of Health in Williamsburg, um, I had been a nurse and boy, I, it was a shock to me of how much I had to really learn and be aware of um, for the Board mm -hmm. of Health. Oh yeah, I remember that as well. Um, the last thing I wanna talk about, <clears throat> excuse me, um, is the, uh, Free St. Patrick Day weekend drinking event. You know, we used to not want to say Blarney blowout, but uh, it was kind of receding and we hoped it was fading, but I really felt like it came back in full force this year. And so it's something that I know we all take very seriously is preventing disease and harm. I mean, it makes us very proud to be doing that. And uh, I feel like, you know, I personally, as the health director, have responsibility for creating, promoting a safe, healthy environment. And I think about the Blarney blowout and my, the numbers that I have um, were 46 um, young adults were sent to the hospital with some kind of alcohol related um, illness. They're probably untold stories. Um, and it's, it's such a serious thing. Now, I think we can also flip it and say that there were some really good things, like I'm hearing really good stories about the, um, the, the, the celebration, um, of improved tenor from last year, um, more responsibility um, and caring for each other. So it's sort of this mix of things, but I just think, um, you know, what happened this year to make it worse? Now, obviously, um, Borg, uh, you know, this blackout rage gallon drink, um, that's something that's been um, uh, around for a while. I don't think it can be linked expressly with the Blarney blot, but it it really contributed to the the mayhem there. So this high alcohol drink in a rapid amount of time, this binge drinking is so destructive and harmful um, to anybody. But when I think about our residents, you know, students are residents, um, and just um, about their uh, it's legal, there's shared decision making, but these binge drinkings, it's so harmful to anybody and these brains are developing brains. So I just want to mm -hmm. ask if there's something that we, I feel as the director, I'm going to do something, um, but I want to know if the Board of Health um, wants to make a statement or if there's any action you want to take well, right uh, now. I mean, I know there's a lot to do. I I, don't know. Yeah. 
we briefly spoke about it, but I've been following this and I've been very concerned. Um, and I think the board needs to make a statement or have it go in our minutes because uh, the seriousness of Saturday compromised the health and safety of the students, not only of the students, but of our other residents. 46 ambulance trips to the hospital. I think 28 it's ambulance trips. 20, but 46. But a number of ambulance trips tied up our ambulances and with the um, uh, mutual aid, other ambulances in our surrounding town. So if a resident of Amherst, Hadley, Northampton, I don't remember, I was looking who else helped respond. Um, that means those towns did not have full ambulance service if there was a, a true emergency for their residents. So that was a real concern um, of mine. I don't know what what we can do. I don't know what other board members think, but um, it, 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 it's very serious for both the students and the residents um, and it compromises all our health and safety. Other board members? Well, clearly it's a, a serious issue, you know, for, for what happened, but also going forward for the end of the semester, which goes well into, you know, the end of May. And I, I don't know if this pretends some difficult weekends, you know, if the weather was terrible uh, for this past weekend for any kind of outdoor partying, which, which usually is uh, part of the problem. But, um, you know, it, it does make me anxious to think about what's going forward. I can see what UMass, uh, read about what UMass is trying to do and, you know, communicate with the students. I mean, really, this is a student thing. Um, I don't know what we can do or say that's going to impact this, really. Um, this little trend that happened, I think people weren't familiar with, didn't know how to regulate, perhaps, and, and really got a lot of people in more trouble than usual. But um, it's a it's sort of annual event, but this one was, again, was worse in terms of the actual alcohol intake, I guess. And the town and university gained national attention. I have friends from the West yeah. Coast that said, what's happening at UMass? Yeah, <laughs> no, it was the front page of a lot of people. Yeah. Um, um, I think I think in my um, glance, of my my two cents. I, I think um, the the town council mentioned that um, there were a lot of people from that came from outside of town that made the crowds larger. A thousand people, you know, gathered in one area, um, but no one you know, died and however chaotic it was, I think it, it tests systems and sees how systems are doing well and how systems can be coordinated. So maybe in that sense, it was helpful. And sometimes, you know, young people, they, they, they do certain irrational things um, because they know that there, there's some security, whether it, it was their friends that were looking out for them or they knew that, you know, there was emergency services that were available. Um, and like, it, it is a planned event. So I just, those were just my thoughts, but I don't know how anybody else feels about it. Yeah, but, I mean, this didn't include any university authorized events. This was just, a, you know, a spontaneous sort of historical uh, 
uh, event, you know, that, that people want to bring back or relive or whatever. I did also read that there were more people perhaps from out of town, even though they weren't allowed to stay in the, in the dorms. You know, I don't think the UMass allowed, allowed people, visitors over this past weekend, but people were staying with friends off campus or, you know, sleeping in their car or whatever um, to, to be here for that kind of experience. So, you know, the fact that no one died, we're lucky and we don't know, you know, how that affected, uh, like Nancy was saying, other, other services. I, they, we, we did, they did call for a mutual aid, but also activated MEMA on this one, the oh, Massachusetts did? Immune. Yes. Yeah. Wow. And I think from, and think, think if the ambulances from as far away as Long Meadow might have been involved. So it, it was a big deal. Um, now, historically, uh, there's a problem. So for a while, so maybe 20 years ago, bars opened like at 8 a.m. and people would go to bars and start drinking and throwing up all over downtown. So the bars reacted and they closed and they did not support Barney Blowout. And then about nine or 10 years ago is when we had thousands of people. You, you, couldn't, you couldn't drive down Fearing Street and many others because there were thousands of kids drinking in the street. And the university responded and had programs on campus and they sort of kept it in a, a little more in control. So here we go. Uh, another 10 years. And so it seems like every eight to 10 years, it, it gets out of control. And uh, there are elements to try and bring it back into control. But I think the important statement is it compromises the health and safety, not only of the students, but our residents and residents in the surrounding towns. And it, it needs to be addressed because it, it puts... Every, it puts the crest workers, it puts the police, it puts the, the fire department, the EMTs, it, it puts pressure on everybody. Um, and fortunately, we have not had untoward out, outcomes, but another time we can. So I don't, I don't think we can do anything, but I think we can make a statement that um, is concerned and hope that uh, the town powers to be can work with the university um, to get this in control again. If anyone has ideas of what we as a board can do, or Jen, for you, how we could support you as a, in the department. Oh, thank you. You know, I appreciate that. You know, I just, just want to start sort of assessing, see what's going on and, mm -hmm. and gather and analyze. I just I hate to think that this just uh, sort of goes by the wayside or we wait or we don't take action or we're too timid and something really detrimental happens um, again and we didn't do anything. Um, you know, I had this sort of thought, it's like, man, can we, can we outlaw those containers you know is there anything <laughs> that the board can do it's like no. i don't like nips but i we can't you know what can we do and i just don't know oh, there's anything like that i guess they said those were closed containers because they had a top on them so right. that was okay um right you could potentially mix it yourself and say hey you know as your alcohol content it could be as low as you want it to be, you know, right? Or no one can slip anything into a closed. But and yeah, it's very clever. They'll... Yeah, and next yeah. year, who knows? It might be something else. It might mm -hmm. problem solve the Borg, but it'll be something else next year. I never so, heard of Borg until this weekend. They've been mm -hmm. around Not apparently. The day of TikTok. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Pamela, have you heard anything like that from your college health experience, recent college health experiences? No, not really. I, I was no. really concerned about this um, 
mixing vodka with electrolytes and um, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, that seemed to you know add a new twist to it mm -hmm. um sweet but you know i mean I, yeah i know drinking yeah. is a problem at smith but not as much as it is here apparently so. mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah I was um, just going to add, it was also mentioned that was, there was no counter um, activities on that mm -hmm. day. And um, mm -hmm. there, you know, a way to help provide that. And all, um, also some of the, the, the parties, is there, is there a difference between when the parties are on campus and when they're off campus? Because if they're off campus, um, I think there's more tendency for things to get out of control. But I, I don't know if if the Board of Health can provide any ideas for counter activities or activities during the, the day. I, I believe most of this was all off campus. Although the counter activity still may benefit if there's some draw, I think in the past they they did do some serious um, attractive counter activities, which seem to help some big act names come, and and that's been pretty successful, I think, in the past. Yeah. There's also been, I think, like certain areas. Well, Fearing Street, I'm sure, is one, but townhouse apartments seem yeah. to be an area that where this is a more of a problem maybe I don't know and I'm not sure that there's anything you know that a townhouse you know, and I heard that there were over a thousand people in the streets on North Whitney Street I, I don't know if that's accurate yeah it seemed that seemed like an unusual spot south whitney i think that it's just that short street between mm -hmm. Main street or well and, that lower part of main street and a lot of north and south whitney has turned into student rentals i i don't know i mean and i guess the police handled that well in a way that they didn't you know they they watched it until it was a problem and then they took action um but if you can i don't know if it's okay to party in the street you know that doesn't seem quite right so i i don't i i understand they're trying to work with the what they have and um and when there are that many people around it's kind of tricky to handle it Nine years ago, it was fearing, and I didn't go up and check what happened, but usually fearing northern part of Lincoln Avenue, nutting all down there, Barney Blowout Weekend has two dozen cops from all over Western Massachusetts because they have their, their patrol cars from other towns, and they're all standing on those corners starting like eight o'clock in the morning. Um, so they've, they've kept it off of fearing in those neighborhoods. So they just sort of, it's like whack-a-mole, they move. But you're right, the complexes in North Amherst too are, I've driven on Pine, is it my Meadow Street, I guess. And yeah. <laughs> it, see a lot of action. Okay, so if it goes in our minutes that we're very concerned about the health and safety and we, do hope that the university um, and our town um, leaders can work out something for the safety. Also, paying for all of this, who pays for all these extra police and EMTs and ambulances in town? I don't know. I think we do. <laughs> Yeah, that's what, that's I think we do too. So that's that's a huge cost. Mm -hmm. Yeah. More, anything more on your report? No, thank you. I'm all set.
Okay, there's absolutely no attendees, so I don't see any public comment. Topics not anticipated by the chair. Two of them we've sort of touched on. One is I got an email um, from Philip Avila, who is the co-chair of the Human Rights Commission. And he was reaching out to see if the Board of Health would be interested in joining a joint listening session with the uh, Human Rights Commission, Affordable Housing Trust and Community Safety Social Justice Committee on the topic of affordable housing in Amherst um, and addressing complaints regarding landlords upkeep of rentals. So I am going to a planning meeting with them on March 22nd. Would other people be interested in attending the listening session when it, and I will keep you up to date about the time and place of the listening session. Um, if anyone is interested in joining me at that listening session. Um, I also, um, uh, spoke with Ed, and I'm going to ask them to include um, Ed in the invitation for the listening session, seeing that it's related to housing conditions. Possibly, I wanted to know the date, it, you know, whether it works or not. As soon as I get any more information, I'll post it to everybody. Good. Uh, But it's, um, as I said, it's it just in the planning stages right now. And I just got this email. So I will keep you up to date. I wanted to let you know about that. Um, and then a, I want to urge members, if they know of anyone who would be interested in serving on the board, to have them fill out the community activity form um, for the town so that we have a... Uh, good number of people to interview for our uh, two positions. And I hope that they can get filled in, in June so that come July 1st, you have members because having only three members through the summer is gonna be on the board would, would pose interesting pieces. <laughs> There are only three of you starting July 1st. Yikes. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that's all I have. Um, does anyone have anything else they want to say for the good of the board or the health department? So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Jen. Um, thanks, Nancy Schroeder, who does a great job with our minutes, and they have a motion. Mm -hmm. with, oh, our next meeting is April 13th at 5.30 via Zoom, unless we hear something else from the state. Yeah, I think if we post it, then, right, so we'll wait and see. Yeah. So it is, it is April 13th. Can yeah. I say April 3rd? April 13th. Um, and then we'll be kept up to date with what the state says about in-person versus Zoom. I know hybrid isn't a possibility because of the cost and the, the technology needed. I think there's gonna be some, but it'll be limited, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, may have a motion to adjourn. I move to adjourn. Okay, a second. I'll second that. Okay. Um, voting on favor. Maureen? Aye. Kremla? Aye. Lauren? Aye. Aye. So we will adjourn and thank you all once again for all your work. Most appreciated. Thank you. Take thank care. You. Good night. Bye. Good night. Good night. Good night.